Ako po si Chris Godinez, your moderator tonight. Nagtapos po ako ng law sa UP. Uh, tonight, kasama ko po si uh, Don Tagala, co-moderator po natin, uh, erstwhile science researcher and now is a broadcast journalist. Kasama po namin si Chito Quijano, organizing director for the largest group of registered nurses in the U.S., the National Nurses United. Si Mo Marbisaya, kasama rin po namin, uh, nag-organize nito, executive editor of the Bicoastal uh, Asian Journal Publications, and Noel Pangilinan, editor of, at the Asian American Writers Workshop and uh, professor of uh, Philippine Literature and History at the College of Mount St. Vincent. We are being supported by the UP Alumni Association in America with the help of uh, former President Nelsie Parado and current President Daisy M. Rodriguez. So for those of you just joining us now, um, welcome po le, kumusta? So bakit tayo may tambayan talk? Uh, apparently, the Philippine military is targeting the University of the Philippines and tagged it as the recruitment base of the rebel group New People's Army. Tonight, we will focus on the Philippine military seemingly renewed hostility towards UP. Uh, before we dig in, a few uh, reminders. The audience will be on mute for the duration of our speakers' presentations. We will unmute when the Q&A begins. The speakers are Lisa Magtoto, Rafi Aquino, and Fidel Nemenso in that order. According to topic po yan, hindi yan according to student number. Chito Quijano will provide a brief rejoinder to the points they raise. And uh, at the Q&A, just raise your hands uh, by clicking on the icon below. Uh, Paki-click na lang. I think it should be there. Or post them in the chat box. Let's keep our questions short and sweet. Feel free to click the reaction button as well. A recorded version of this UP Tambayan talk will be available. Let me turn you over to Don Tagala, who will introduce our first speaker. Magandang gabi, everyone from the Philippines to the US. So, our first speaker is a friend and a former co worker of the ABS EBIN um, educational TV show, Sinisquela. So, Lisa Magtoto is a multi award winning playwright and script writer, a theater artist and teacher. She won Carlos Palanca Award, Literature Awards, uh, the most prestigious literary honors in the Philippines for her full length and one act plays. Lisa was a staff member of the Philippine Collegian, UP's official student publication. So Lisa was also named by the Armed Forces of the Philippines on a social media post listing her as a dead or captured UP alumnus who joined Dao, the New People's Army. So obviously it's not true. She's with us tonight, uh, very much alive. Um, so Lisa, take it away. Hi, thank you, Dawn. Uh, good evening to all our friends, alumni, uh, family, uh, lahat dyan na nasa US, and good morning dito sa Pilipinas. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about, um, you know, what, siguro my life. <laughs> my life as a former UP student and how it affected me, you know, as an artist, as a writer, as a theater person. And, um, uh, well, I, I would speak about this journey because it somehow affected uh, you know yung yung buhay ko yung paano ako uh, gumal gumalaw at uh, nag decision sa buhay at and i don't know if this was an, had an impact in the red tagging that was uh, na ako sa na, na, napasama no anyway uh, nung nag UP kasi ako noon um ang bumulaga talaga sa akin noon ay isang play yung scholar ng bayan uh, yung i don't know if you remember that it's a dulatula at uh, parang natuwa ako doon eh kasi iba dit iba talaga doon sa UP you know uh, so later on i would learn that this is what you call academic freedom so maraming iba't ibang mga uh, kaganapan sa UP well there would be symposiums with Jose Jocno, okay, this will reveal my age, okay, so Jose Jocno, Sine Rene Sagisag, and uh, Tanyada, the grand old man, and um, and you would see Philippine Collegian on the floors of the in the halls, and then you would see the banner na, kung hindi ngayon, kailan pa, kung hindi kakikilos, sinong kikilos, 
all these things, you know, and then um, meron din mga uh, plays that I would see, yung mga allegorical plays, seditious plays, and I didn't even know about American colonial rule that uh, all the torture that they did sa kababayan natin, ano. So, uh, kasabay nito was uh, my exposure also with PETA. So, so all these things, you know, parang talagang uh, nakakatuwa in a sense that uh, I was opened up. Parang talagang bumoka talaga yung, yung consciousness ko. Um, at yun yung nakatulong sa akin para mabuo ko yung aking mga paninindigan sa buhay. Uh, of course, prior to that, meron ka na siya yung mga compassion for people and uh, and you know so 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 all these things ano nag nabuo ito sa akin and sabi nga nung isa kong kaibigan noon uh, ako kasi ako yung naghanap ng organization eh nasasalihan eh kasi parang given all the exposure that I was having already in UP parang gusto ko na talagang may salihan para may magawa ako dahil sa mga nakikita ko at nalalaman ko at nangyayari sa bansa at that time ito sa Marco dictatorship and you can see the inequities you can see the violence and the harassment and, and everything so uh sa ano isa kong kaibigan kung walang movement na or organization gagawa daw siya so parang ganoon eh so it nobody would recruit me you know may ron nagre-recruit sa akin taga Campus Crusade for Christ mga ganyan Opus Dei etc and all that Pero talaga, ano, ano, naghahanap ka ng magagawa para sa, dahil sa mga nangyayari sa bansa. So, how did the all this inform my uh, writing and my art? So, parang doon ko naisip, ano nga ba talaga ang role ko sa society? What is the role of art? Is the role of a writer in society? So, first and foremost, citizen din kasi ako eh. And I see the inequities. I see violence against women, children, and even men in all forms, ano, discrimination against uh uh, people in the in the lower in the, in the margins and LGBTQ, the inefficiency of the government, violence against the poor. So, ang talagang nakita ko rin sa mga place na napanood ko from PETA to UP Rep, na art is there to question and to disturb, to give voice to the marginalized. So, to question it in all forms, no, in whether that be uh, through visual arts, through um, uh, what do you call poetry, through plays, etc., no? to music, at uh, through, all, through all kinds of tones, satire, humor, you know, tragedy, etc., and to participate in these discussions and to join rallies. So, um, hindi pwede yung sasabihin mag-artista ka na lang, you know, so, which, which is happening now to uh, even prominent people like Angel Loxi, Lisa Soberana, who are being red-tagged as well. And uh, UP and also PETA uh, taught me to research, you know, to immerse myself in uh, the lives of the people. Ano ba nangyayari talaga sa kanila? In order for me to be able to write truthfully about them, how they live, how they talk, how they walk, no? So how they think. And and you give us a certain perspective and kung ano yung nilalaman ng iyong kalooban at uh, ano sa tingin mo ang dapat mangyari. Somehow nire-reflect mo yan uh, sa iyong mga gawa. No? So lagi kong kinakawing sa societal problems because you know na, nothing exists in a vacuum. Even when I was writing Rock of Ages, kasi nung nagkaroon kami ng parang tinatawag namin na PETA night, uh, which is like a critics night among members, sinabi nung isang taga-PETA, ay akala ko puro love songs lang yan, puro love story lang. Hindi eh. Parang feeling ko bilang taga-UP ako noon at, at uh, taga-PETA, um, kailangan ipakita mo that these people do not exist in a vacuum. That they are a product also of society. At meron silang, meron nangyayari sa kanila dahil sa mga nangyayari sa environment, dahil sa nangyayaring uh, corruption sa, sa, sa ligid, sa, sa pamahalaan, etc. So anyway, nung... Uh, Na-red tag ako noong January, no? uh, nananahimik ako noon. And ang akala ko noon, uh, kaya ako na-red tag kasi meron ako na-post about uh, defending academic freedom dahil kaka, uh, labas, medyo kakalabas lang noon ng mga balita tungkol sa pag-abrogate uh, ng uh, UPDND accord. 
So parang ang ano ko, uh, nung, uh, akala ko baka yun, no? It, they generated the hashtag and all that. And then nakita randomly yung pangalan ko. Then they just pick it up like that. Kaya lang hindi, nakita ko kasi yung aking esteemed ng mga kabatch, bigate ng mga kabatch ko doon sa red tag list na yun. Ano? So, uh, hindi yata. No? Mukhang it's an old ano, list na sinur- nirevive nila. So, syempre, meron akong fear noon. Uh, nananahimik lang kasi ako noon and all that. I had this fear na, you know, yung may nagraran sa akin na scenario yung nangyari doon sa dalawang, I think former teachers ba yun? Nakalimutan ko na kung anong ano nila. Uh, and they were, uh, na, ni-raid yung bahay nila or they, they were arrested. They're not active in any movement, I think. No? So, so yun yung mga, may mga ganun akong fears. Kasi under this government, they would, walang discernment eh, walang due process. So, Buti na lang, I, uh, Peto was very supportive of me and uh, the, uh, and also other organizations and uh, most especially UP, no? the UP alumni. Uh, sabi nga ni, ano, nung isang ano, yung butihing uh, uh, may bahay ni Fidel, sabi niya sa akin noon, UP natin ito, if you need help, sabi niya. So, natouch ako doon. You know? So, maswerte lang na may kakilala sa UP at may mga kabatsya kong ganito na we, we organize ourselves and uh, ha- had a press con you know, to, pla- to 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 uh, correct this uh, misinformation so parang ang fear ko doon syempre wa ano pa ano, ano na to no? so do we exercise self self censorship do we repress our thoughts as artists is is this uh an implication ano so ano yung uh, are they they are sowing fear no among those who would uh post critical Uh, questions about them are they this is like saying oh hindi kayo pwede magsalita against the government so mahirap yan kasi ang artists we thrive in expressing our thoughts freeing our innermost longings for a better state of being and of society and of the world so pag sinabi ng mga tao sa akin oh, oh mag-ingat ka ha ano, ano kaya ibig sabihin noon o wag ka masyado lalapit sa mga taga, mga, mga makakaliwa. Uh, ano yun? Kasi uh, when the government cannot discern and use due process, uh, parang ang hirap naman yata um, maging maingat. No? Dahil meron ka sa kailangan sabihin din about what's happening now. When what we... Kasi what we witness now is they shoot first before they ask questions. They disseminate a fake list without double checking and verifying the facts they abrogate the UPDND accord before consulting the UP community so i think what we should you know what they should do is to address the cause of dissent and we shouldn't have fear to express uh, our thoughts about these things because in a healthy democracy dapat nakikinig tayo sa isa't isa para alam natin ano ang pwedeng gawin so we can have better lives yun lang naman talaga, di ba? Yun lang po. Maraming salamat po. And so, maraming salamat, Liza. And, you know, in short, activism is not terrorism. So, let us defend academic freedom as well. So, our next speaker is Attorney Rafi Aquino, um, a longtime member of FLAG, the largest and oldest organization of human rights lawyers in the Philippines. He is currently co-counsel for one of those 37 groups of petitioners who are challenging the constitutionality of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. He was an active student leader who served in the University Student Council in 1981, and he was chairman of the Sandigan Para sa Mag-aaral at Sambayanan, or SAMASA. So just like Lisa, Rafi was, one of, uh, was on the same list of dead UP NPAs, but he is also very much alive. So let, uh, please welcome Attorney Rafi Aquino. Uh... Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat, mga fellow scholars ng bayan sa Amerika at dito sa Pilipinas. <clears throat> yeah, I think that there is a new counterinsurgency effort against the hard left in the Philippines. By hard left, I mean the CPP and PA. And we are all collateral damage. This new counterinsurgency has three unique elements. First, it is accompanied by an aggressive propaganda effort in both traditional and social media 
designed around red scare messaging and red tagging. Second, it is enabled by a new legal framework provided by the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. And third, it includes a deliberate targeting of the left wing of the unarmed protest movement, including left-leaning groups and personalities in UP and other schools. Let's examine each of these three elements beginning with red tagging. <clears throat> In his dissenting opinion in the 2015 case of Zarate versus Aquino, Justice Marvick Leonen adopted this definition of red tagging. I quote, the act of labeling and accusing individuals or organizations of being left-leaning, subversives, communists, or terrorists used as a strategy by state agents, particularly law enforcement agencies and the military against those perceived to be threats or enemies of the state." End of quote. Red tagging is mind conditioning, a sustained effort to numb the public to the state's demonization of politically active Filipinos, to lessen resistance to their actual persecution. It is not much different from what the Nazis did to the Jews in the late 1930s, and what Senator McCarthy and his House Committee on Un-American Activities did to many Americans in the early 50s. There is no law that penalizes red tagging in the Philippines, but it is nevertheless a violation of international humanitarian law because it allows the state to militarily target combatants and civilians without distinction. But there is now a law that further enables the state to pursue the civilian targets of red tagging. Let's turn to the second element of the new counterinsurgency, the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. Republic Act 11479, otherwise known as the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 or ATA, was passed by Congress last year in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown. Rather than a scalpel, the ATA is a sledgehammer that may be used not only against terrorists, but also against democratic dissent in general. The ATA works against legitimate dissent mainly in two ways. First, the key concept of terrorism is defined in the ATA in a way that is so vague and confusing. Because of this vagueness, citizens are not fairly notified of what speech or conduct to avoid. At the same time, this vagueness allows law enforcers, government prosecutors, and judges to interpret ter terrorism in different ways, discriminatorily against targeted persons or groups, or broadly to include even the legitimate exercise of civil and political rights. Second, the ATA delegates immense powers to the executive branch, unrestricted by traditional legal safeguards, reminiscent of the Marcos dictatorship. For instance, the Anti-Terrorism Council, an executive agency created under the ATA, may now arrest suspects on its own authority even without judicial warrant, and then detain those arrested for 24 days without being charged in court, a period way beyond the three-day maximum allowed under the Constitution. Moreover, the military is now placed on the same footing as the PNP in law enforcement, in clear violation of the constitutional doctrine of civilian supremacy. Also, Unlike the old terrorism law that provided for its own suspension during elections, the ATA's effectivity is uninterrupted by election campaigning, thus lending itself to abuse by the party in power. Now, how does red tagging and the ATA relate to UP and other schools and to academic freedom? Let's consider the third element. Academic freedom is not just a trending buzzword. 
but a right guaranteed under the 1987 Constitution to institutions of higher learning. With regard to UP, under its charter, Republic Act 9500, academic freedom is both a legal right and a legal duty. However, I look at academic freedom not as an end in itself, but merely as a legal mechanism to protect something more intangible. I refer to intellectual liberty or free thinking. Free thinking means unfettered inquiry, disputation, and clarification. Teaching and learning, research, peer review, and other academic pursuits all feed into the intellectual froth and churn that make up university life. This froth and churn is the primordial soup out of which, occasionally, new knowledge emerges. It is this new knowledge that is the alpha and omega of education. It comprises the unique and irreplaceable contribution of our schools to society and national development. Free thinking is very fragile, however. It is profoundly dependent upon the restraint and forbearance of the state. When the state forgets society's critical need for knowledge and the free thinking required to generate that knowledge, the stage is set for government initiatives as foolhardy as the DND's sudden and unilateral termination of its agreement with UP. Authoritarian states, especially, cannot tolerate the innate irreverence and disruptiveness of free thinking. On the contrary, authoritarian states will forcibly seek ingress to these centers of intellectual liberty for the sole purpose of control. While intellectual disruption is ultimately beneficial to society, the authoritarian state is incapable of the long view, blinded by what it perceives as campus-based threats to national security. While it may be true that the left is alive and well in UP, there is no indication that the cops and soldiers of the state will have the wit or the desire to differentiate between armed NPA partisans on one hand and left-leaning activists and scholars on the other. The threat to UP posed by this new counterinsurgency is thus twofold an immediate threat to the safety and security of its community of scholars, especially of those in the left wing, and a long-term threat to the free thinking essential to UP's ability to create new socially useful knowledge. Let me end with a quote on academic freedom from the separate concurring opinion of Justice Felix Frankfurter of the US Supreme Court in the 1957 case of Sweezy versus New Hampshire. This was uh, right after the, 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 the worst uh, phase of the McCarthy period. Uh, involved here was uh, uh, a professor in uh, a college in New Hampshire uh, who was investigated for his lectures in his class. Sabi ni Justice Frankfurter, who was uh, uh, an alumnus of Harvard before joining the court. For society's good, inquiries into these problems on nature, man, and society, speculations about them, stimulation in others of reflection upon them, must be left as unfettered as possible. Political power must abstain from intrusion into this activity of freedom. There is no need of proof of the dependence of a free society on free universities. This means the exclusion of governmental intervention in the intellectual life of a university. It matters little whether such intervention occurs avowedly or through action that inevitably tends to check the ardor and fearlessness of scholars qualities at once so fragile and so indispensable for fruitful academic labor. So thank you and good evening. We'll just answer your questions later. Salamat.
Okay, maraming salamat, um, Rafi. Ang sigaw nga natin noon, scholar ng bayan ngayon ay lumalaban. So I turn it back to Chris. Uh, you're unmuted, Chris. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Fidel Nemenso. He is a professor of mathematics who currently serves as UP Diliman Chancellor. His areas of research are number theory, elliptical curves, and coding theory. Among the awards he received are the Achievement Award in Mathematics from the National Research Council of the Philippines and the UP Diliman Gawad Chancellor para sa pinakamahusay na guro. He also served as president of both the Southeast Asian Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Society of the Philippines. He was also a founding member of the activist musical group Patatag. Dr. Nemenso. Salamat, salamat Chris. Magandang gabi sa lahat at magandang umaga kung kayo yung nandito sa Maynila. No? Sa totoo lang, I, I, I wish uh, I could really spend more time talking about what UP is doing rather than, you know, uh, defending UP uh, in every occasion from, uh, from uh, defending you defending UP against accusations that is UP is doing nothing but recruit students into the communist movement. Now, last November, the President Duterte threatened to cut funding for UP. And last month, DND, Department of National Defense, unilaterally uh, terminated the agreement uh, with UP that protects uh, UP from militarization. Hindi to bago eh. When I was a new recruit into the student movement in 1980, in fact, one of my recruiters is here, Sinoi. Uh, in 1980, the, the institutional autonomy of UP was threatened with a proposed law called the Education Act of 1980. <laughs> this was one of the events that helped ignite campus activism during uh, the 80s. Exactly 50 years ago, UP Diliman students put up barricades at campus entrances to prevent the police from coming in the campus. This was uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this started as a peaceful solidarity strike you know, with jeepney drivers, and it led to what is known as the Diliman Commune of 1971. This was a year after the FQS, the first quarter storm, which was a series of demonstrations against the Marcos regime. Anyway, nung uh, January 18, nagulat na lang kami nung nakita namin nakapost sa social media ang liham mula sa Secretary of National Defense, si Delfin Lorenzana addressed to the UP president saying that DND is terminating the 1989 agreement between UP and the DND. The agreement lays the guidelines for military operations inside campuses of, in, of the university. Ito ang sabi niya. Ang sabi niya, the agreement uh, is already a hindrance to providing effective security and safety to students, faculty, and employees of UP, which had turned, sabi niya, into a recruitment ground and safe haven for communists and other enemies of the state. Now, this agreement, uh, counting background lang, no? this was agree uh, an agreement with UP and DND signed by then Secretary of National Defense, Fidel Ramos, and uh, then UP President, Jose Abueva. Malinaw ang sabi nito. No? One, ang sabi, the military and police are required to coordinate with UP officials before entering the campus. Two, the university has to be notified before serving any search or arrest warrant or an invitation for, for questioning to any UP student or employee. Three, military, uh, the, the military has, they, they have to be in uniform if they are to enter the campus. Four, no UP student or faculty will be detained without the knowledge of UP officials and the presence of a lawyer provided by UP. And fifth, this is very important for students, the military cannot interfere with peaceful protest actions held in, uh, within any of the UP campuses. Uh, this uh, arrangement is not new. Uh, in 1982, there was the Soto and Real Agreement of 1982, which protects students from police and military operations in schools. Uh, but, um, in 1989, it, 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 hindi, hindi klaro eh kung uh, 
gaano ka binding ang ag- Soto and Rilly agreement sa may eskwela. Siguro wala siyang wala siyang IRR o implementing guidelines, no. But in 1989, there was a staff member of the Philippine Collegian na dinukot sa loob ng Vinson sa uh, building, no. His name was Donato Continente. He spent the next 16 years in prison. And when he was released, he he said that he was tortured to admit to a crime that he did not commit. So, yung pagkadukot ni ni Donat uh, raised concerns about militarization uh, on campus, and it compelled uh, UP officials to dialogue with uh, the Department of National Defense and agree on house rules. Uh, I, I know some of of, uh, of the participants in those talks. In fact, my father was one of the, he was faculty regent then. He said, "Ang sabi niya." Uh, In 1989, the talks were very friendly, you know, because this was a trust-building exercise after martial law and the bitter experience of UP under the military. There was also a new uh, a democratic constitution in place. And so the agreement that was signed was, in a sense, a democratic response to the suppression of UP and all freedoms during the Marcos dictatorship. And since then, the agreement has served as a framework of cooperation between UP and DND. Uh, so, for over 30, 32 years, agreement has allowed both parties to fulfill each of their mandates. No, the provision of a learning environment uh, uh, for learning and uh, intellectual inquiry on the part of UP, and the just enforcement of the law on the part of the military. The claims nila about sa sabi nilang clandestine campus recruitment for terrorist organizations. These are not sufficient grounds to cancel the agreement. First of all, uh, they have no, they had not, they have not provided any uh, solid evidence for all their accusations. Uh, what they've done so far is come out with sloppy lists uh, where um, that included uh, Rafi and Lisa here. No? The agreement safeguards not only the constitutionally guaranteed academic freedom, but also law enforcement. Because ang sabi nito, sabi ng agreement. Nothing herein shall be construed as a prohibition against the enforcement of the laws of the land. So clearly, the implementation of the agreement does not hinder law enforcement. In fact, hindi pinagbabawal ang pagpasok ng military. Ang sinasabi lang, magpaalam kayo. You respect the borders. You respect uh, uh, the, the, uh, the academic freedom of the university. Uh, in fact, uh, the signers, the signatories of the agreement, found no reason to put an exit clause in the agreement, which would allow for unilateral termination. Academic freedom is enshrined in the Philippine Constitution. It is enshrined in the UP Charter. It is not a privilege. Na basa basang aalisin lang, no, ng isang isang panig, no. And and we've always said that there's no justifiable reason for terminating the agreement. Siyempre, hindi nag-agree si Secretary Lorenzana. He terminated this on January 15. Ang sabi niya, the conditions have changed. Ang sabi niya, the agreement was already getting into the way of the military's duty to provide security and safety uh, for students of UP. And UP was turning into a recruited, recruitment ground for the left. Of course, this drew a uh, fierce and strong reaction from, from the UP community because we felt that the unilateral abrogation of an agreement was unjust without legal basis. This, remember, this was an agreement between two parties that was signed in good faith. No? Uh, more importantly, and this was an assault on academic freedom in the university. This was a move of the, part of the move of the government to silence its critics. Um, for faculty and students of UP and probably all its graduates since 1908, ang, ang UP is not only a demilitarized zone, no? it is a sanctuary with its own ethical principles. And these are academic freedom. Uh, and it's being a safe space for speech, for assembly, for expression. Ito ang kagandahan ng UP education. And I'm sure all of you uh, agree with this. No? The beauty of the education we receive is that students are exposed to a vibrant, a diverse, a multidisciplinary learning environment where critical thinking is valued and nurtured, diba? We are exposed to the widest range of perspectives. This is a, a safe space where one can think, can create, can discuss, can let imaginations fly. A safe space where we can question prevailing norms and assumptions. 
a space where we can challenge authority without fear of punitive action. Um, uh, without fear of punitive action. This, as an, this is an important precondition for academic freedom, a precondition for learning and free thought, about the absence of fear. This is why the agreement is an important guarantee, but not the only guarantee of academic freedom. Ang, ang UP was set up by Amer Americans in 1908 to train the best high school students to take over governance of the country. That mandate remains true today. UP students from all over the Philippines are educated in sciences, social sciences, the humanities, management sciences, the professions. They are, in a sense, accorded special treatment uh, by virtue of UP being the national university. No? The, the graduates of UP are called the nation's hopes. Kaya, kaya nga, kung matatandaan nyo, ang huling linya ng UP naming mahal, sabi nyo, mabuhay ang pag-asa ng bayan. But, and UP is just like the military. Universities like UP were established to serve the nation. No? But unlike the military, UP serves the nation by training students, by contributing knowledge across various disciplines through critical thinking. Schools like UP thrive because they are markets of uh, marketplaces of ideas, promoters of intellectual freedom. In UP, we are trained to question every assumption, every argument, every convention. Uh, now, um, there are, of course, uh, state leaders who recognize the value of schools as social critics because uh, criticism keeps uh, leaders on their, tones, on, on their toes. There's this crazy suggestion from the Commission of Higher Education uh, last month no, that uh, it should convene a panel of experts who will define the meaning of academic freedom and the role of security in the protection of academic freedom. No? Nakakagulato. Ang sabi nga na isang law dean, no? and I will quote, sabi niya, this is the most intrusive, gross, and unconstitutional government, government action that can ever be done in, with regard to education. While the 1987 constitution said that academic freedom sh shall be enjoyed in all institutions of higher le learning, the constitution had good reason why no definition was given. No? Because to define academic freedom is to limit it. Uh, freedom, by its very essence, you know, should be expansive. You know? um, the leaders should recognize that it is freedom that allows ideas to soar, which is necessary if we are to build a culture of R&D, uh, a culture of innovation. You know? Because of academic freedom, UP has produced graduates across disciplines who, who can dream, who can think big for the country. It has produced graduates who are mission-driven and service-oriented. It, it is UP's learning environment that has allowed its researchers to think out of the box and into path-breaking areas of research and discoveries across various fields. It has allowed our university's artists and, and, and writers their creative freedom, which is necessary if they are to disturb, as, as Lisa said, if they are to break convention and create new art. Even in my own area of research, I'm a scientist and mathematician, many discoveries would not have been possible without academic freedom. Just think of Galileo. You know, if learning was just the endless repetition of established ideas, science and the pursuit of knowledge would die. You know, some of the most important ideas in science, like Darwin's theory of evolution or Einstein's theory of relativity, these were deeply subversive. These began with criticism and the critical examination of established viewpoints. So this is why universities, our great universities, are hubs of interrogation and innovation. Great universities are centers of subversion and critical thinking. And this is why we zealously defend academic freedom. And this is why the UP community, including alumni, are waging a campaign on all fronts to defend itself from militarization and uphold the agreement. The young DND secretary who is claiming that UP is no longer safe for students because it is now a breeding ground for communists, 
he forgets that UP produces more leaders and innovators across the spectrum, across all disciplines. No? Every year, the university produces graduates, uh, it produces leaders, uh, doctors, artists, lawyers, scientists, educators, communi community workers, and yes, even leaders and cadres of the left. Anyway, um, we, and I'm addressing all of you, UP alumni, all of us were nurtured and educated in this learning environment. And this learning environment is now in peril because of the termination of the UP d, &D agreement. And this is why we must continue to defend UP and academic freedom. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the Diliman barricades. There are no students on campus. We cannot put up uh, barricades to defend UP. But uh, as, I, as I say, the best defense now, right now, at this point, the best defense is information, is an, uh, a campaign to raise awareness of, uh, of the value of UP education, which is now in peril because of uh, um, the moves of the military and the government. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nemenso. Um, wow, uh, daming points na ni-raise ang ating mga speakers. And I think uh, Chito Quijano, our next speaker, has his work cut out for him. Um, ano ang response natin dito sa um, UP alumni dito sa, sa Amerika? Ano, ano ang tingin mong dapat natin um, tutukan at gawin? Chito? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. Um, you know, um, thank you to Lisa Magtoto, Tony Rafi Aquino, and Dr. Fidel Nemenso for uh, these compelling insights about academic freedom and civil, civil liberties in general. Uh, Lisa Magtoto pointed out when she was red tagged, and it's, instead of being silent, she instead expressed the reasons why people are dissenting. So the purpose of uh, red tagging her did not work. Uh, it's a failure. On, on those people who, who uh, attempted uh, to uh, silence her. Um, thanks to Rafi for sharing, uh, who shared um, the definition of the red tagging and um, telling us that the academic freedom is a legal right and a legal duty under the Philippine constitution. Um, and rightfully uh, pointed out that uh, authoritarian states do not tolerate criticism. Um, and uh, thanks to Dr. Fidel Nemenso, who gave us the background of the UPDND agreement and the contents of this agreement, and uh, what triggered it. And um, you know, you mentioned Donato Continente. Donat is a good friend of mine because he's married to um, uh, to Cute. We call her Cute. Uh, uh, when I was in uh, UP. Um, um, uh, Cute is one of the activists and, and, and uh, uh, happened to get married to, to, uh, to Donut. And, um, and knowing that background, like uh, saying that background, it's just because uh, I didn't know that. So thanks, uh, thanks for, for that uh, reminder. Um, and um, um, as you said, there's no sufficient grounds in abrogating the agreement. The agreement safeguards the enforcement of the law. Therefore, the unilateral abrogation of the agreement is an assault on academic freedom. And because of the academic freedom allowed to foster development of society and to suppress academic freedom would stop the development of society. That's how would I summarize what uh, Dr. Nemenso um, have shared to us. And as a former UP student and um, considered people scholars, we have the responsibility to serve the people. Why? Uh, University of Philippines is a state university and therefore funded by the people's taxes. So when the majority of the people are starving, are unemployed, do not have decent housing, no access to healthcare, then it is our responsibility to speak up and question. But if people are speaking up or being suppressed, um, then us here, who are in, in the US, who live in the US, who are uh, as taxpayers, uh, we have the right to know where our taxes go. And it's important to note that every year, the US government sends tens of millions of dollars to the Philippine military. So if the military is suppressing the people, 
violating academic freedom and civil rights, then we have to speak up and make a stand and defend, defend our people. Um, as a former Chief Justice Panganiban said, if you want to stop NPA in recruitment, then end poverty. Do not suppress the people. Um, thank you, Chris, and thank you all for um, those who uh, joined us tonight. All right, thank you, Chito. We have uh, questions in our chat box. Uh, please let us know if you want to ask the questions yourself. Uh, Don will be handling questions going forward, Don. Hi, so for the Q&A session, please post your questions on the chat room space and we'll pick your questions from there. And please have your questions ready then, uh, make it short and sweet, direct to the question, please. Pero let me ask first the, the first question for our panel, Lisa and Attorney Rafi. Um, Lisa, Rafi, to be listed as dead or captured at UP alumni na NPA member Dow allegedly, how was that like for you and how did that impact your life? Did you feel unsafe? So take us through the emotions of you know, being um, labeled as such, Aliza. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was quite, you know, uh, afraid. So at, at first, parang, alam mo, yung medyo, parang between amused and afraid and medyo hinay blood ako actually. You know? The next day I had, <laughs> uh, medyo nag-increase yung blood pressure ko. Uh, but it was, it was quite um, uh, a fearful moment. Because you'll never know what they're going to do because in this administration, uh, they they don't discern, they don't know, they don't, they just pick you up or, you know, they don't show any due process. So, medyo nakakatakot talaga. And, uh, yun. I, I, there was this chilling effect and you, you don't know what will happen next. But, uh, buti na lang, Maswerte ako, nakasama ko tong sina Rafi and uh, all the others in the list who are uh, uh, connected to media and we were able to organize ourselves immediately. So, um, Attorney Rafi, did it feel like martial law, Marcus martial law all over again? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, most certainly. You know, it was a Friday, I think. <clears throat> um, Around yeah, shortly after lunch, uh, I was told that an article I wrote on on the abrogation of the UPD and the accord uh, was uh, published on Facebook by Rappler. Uh, it's an online publication. Um, bef as I was looking at uh, the post, uh, I got word that there was another post also on Facebook accusing me of being dead or captured. Uh, and being an NPA. Um, so my first reaction was, ang bilis ng DND, ah. na-pick up ka agad yung pinost ko sa Rappler. Red tag na ako kagad. So uh, the first one who called me was Lisa Dakanay. And then nagbibiruan pa kami because uh, ang naalala namin, si Mark Twain, no? what he said about uh, the news of his death being exaggerated. And then the worry set in so that by uh, that evening, that very same evening, meron na kaming chat group uh, set up by Lisa over here at nag-uusap na kami. Swerte kami, ang isang nakasama namin, si Roel Landingin, uh, who is married to Malu Mangahas. Malu, of course, is a pillar of Philippine journalism. So ang bilis naming nakagather ng uh, napakaraming journalists. By Saturday, uh, we were facing the media and bringing our situation and our story to them. Um, ta tapos, uh, in that, in that uh, press conference, ang lakas din ng presence ng UP community led by uh, Chancellor Fidel. And uh, we felt so uh, protected, so safe, because our, our university, the community we came from, was there for us. Okay? Uh, nagkaroon ng confluence eh, dahil at that time, uh, tinitira na rin ng UP, ng DND, so nagkaroon ng confluence. Uh, 
And then, sabi nga nung, nung isa naming kasama, si Alex Padilla, na totoo, natakot kami para sa sarili namin, pero mas pronounced yung concern para do sa mga ibang biktima ng red tagging na walang ganong access to resources, walang ganong access to connections, to, to UP, to media, and to uh, lawyers, di ba? Kawawa naman talaga, eh, mananahimik na lang at yun yung chilling effect na, na sinasabi. And uh, if we, we consider na free expression is really foundational to democracy, that chilling effect of red tagging uh, is really uh, unacceptable and outrageous. So, okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is coming from Melissa Loja. Um, uh, her question is, has the AFP PNP ever requested to conduct an operation inside the campus? And has UP ever denied that request uh, for the panel? Perhaps um, Chancellor Fidel? Well, I've, I've, uh, I've in uh, uh, last year, I invoked the, the agreement to um, keep the police out you know, when uh, there were uh, protest actions, uh, protest rallies on campus. I don't remember of um, the, the there have been violations of uh, of the agreement when police came in to conduct an operation without authorization from UP, and uh, we've used the agreement to file uh, uh, strong complaints. But um, um, as I said uh, uh, last year, there were huge uh, uh, mass actions during the sauna and uh, during June 11. The police wanted to come in. I wrote the police and reminded them that. Uh, that the agreement uh, uh, is in place and that uh, uh, we have enough security forces on campus to police our own ranks. Ang sabi namin, doon na kayo sa lakas. Sumunod naman sila. Okay, so the next question will be from Marina Durano. Marina, uh, please ask your question. Maraming salamat, Rafi Miguel. Good to see you both. Um, I'm a little confused as to the purpose of uh, abrogation, right? Um, my understanding is that Duterte already has absolute control of the board, the branches, you name it. He owns these places. So, what's the point? Uh, <laughs> I mean, what does he need to pester UP for? I mean, really? It's, is there that kind of level of criticism, level of protest? I mean, it like, am I assuming that there's? Am I mistakenly assuming that there's a logic behind the abrogation, or it's just some random thing to prove a point, and that's it? You know. So I, I'm just I want to understand the political trajectory behind this this particular thing, the, the abrogation. But for you not to talk about it in isolation, but to talk about it in the grander plan of Duterte for absolute control for authoritarian constitution, which I think he already has. So if you can just clarify that. Um, I mean, the, the, the bigger context here is, of course, the, the anti-terrorism uh, Anti-terrorism Act, no, the, the failure of the peace talks, and uh, the fact that Duterte, uh, uh, I mean, he has uh, he has uh, only two years to to fulfill his promises to end the communist insurgency. Um, uh, mass, uh, uh, massive funding has been provided to an, a new uh, unit in uh, in the military called El Cac, no, or the National Task Force to end the local communist insurgency. So uh, they've been waging this campaign across uh, all fronts, and kasama na dito ang ang red tagging campaign uh, at yung etong uh, uh, bagong anti-terrorism act na binabanggit ni Rafi kanina. Rafi, iba ka gusto mong ipaliwanag yan? Uh, uh, hi, Marina. Um, like I said. Uh, this, this initiative is really driven by the security sector. Uh, Duterte is there because he understands that uh, 
all these tools uh, being uh, pushed by the security sector can also be very easily appropriated or borrowed by, by him uh, for purposes of regime replication, if that is indeed his direction. But uh, uh, independently of that, uh, this is a security sector driven. Uh, <clears throat> it coincides with the last uh, 15 months of uh, uh, the Duterte administration. Um, and uh, more than any other initiative before, the element of uh, propaganda uh, is very prominent. Uh, and this takes the form of red tagging. And uh, the propaganda is complemented by the very strong legal framework provided by the Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, which is really aimed at uh, quelling dissent and uh, controlling speech and expression. Um, so yes, it coincides with uh, the last uh, few uh, months of uh, President Duterte's term. Um, banggitin ko lang, ano, uh, there is this uh, new issuance by the uh, Regional Police Enforcement uh, Center for the Cordilleras, uh, <clears throat> directing the conduct of Tokhang for left-leaning personalities. Okay, so it is a replication of the war on drugs template, this time applied to an initiative against uh, the left. The problem here is this. It does not differentiate between the civilians who are left-leaning or with communist sympathies, which is constitutionally protected, by the way, and the bearing of arms which is not constitutionally protected, okay? Um, this is not just a matter of Philippine law. This is a matter of international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law is that entire body of international norms that apply in situations of armed conflict, okay? It uh, says that both parties to the armed conflict should concentrate only on military targets, okay? And should not uh, cross the divide and uh, uh, attack uh, soft targets or civilian targets. Okay? That is why I said that we are all collateral damage here, okay? Um, the military, red tagging by the, you do not red tag an NPA soldier, right? You only red tag a civilian who happens to be progressive or, or leaning towards the left in his thoughts and in his sympathies. Okay? And that is a violation of international norms. Um, <clears throat> every, all, all the elements of this new counterinsurgency uh, violate international humanitarian law. And that is uh, the disturbing element in all of these. Okay, salamat, attorney. So the next few questions will be coming from members of our Filipino American Press Club of New York. And let's start with Marivere Montebon. Marivere? Are you on? Okay, um, if Marivere is not on, uh, her question is, what will it take to embolden people to oppose Duterte's militarism, considering that the government is gross, uh, grossly corrupt and inefficient? Uh, who can answer that question? Lisa. Lisa. It's really difficult. That's a that's like a million dollar question that <laughs> we're all asking ourselves, because uh, it's not just you know the it's not just economic. It's also cultural. It's everything. So I think on all fronts we have to move. Uh, actually, meron nga nagbiro noon eh. Kapag tinanggal na yung probinsyano sa ABS, or you know, tanggal ang ABS, baka mag ng gusto mga tao. Because, you know, they really connect with that uh, television series. And kapag nawala yun, baka sakali. 
hindi rin eh, di ba, nawala ang ABS-CBN because also of this government. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I think it's a painstaking uh, act eh. uh, Kasi uh, even I am frustrated with, you know, after when, when this administration already came, uh, was ruling, yung ilang years na pinaglaban nyo na women's rights, biglang parang, ha? Huh? Uh, and, and napaka misogynistic ng mga remarks and everything and suddenly parang bumalik ka sa, sa middle ages ano? and so parang uh, I think it's it's gonna be it has to be on all fronts na ano eh yung, yung pag-awaken um, from the grassroots from the from on the ground and and I don't know I really hope that walang mangyaring masamang masama para di, para lang magising ang mga tao at kumilos. But it's, uh, I think, everybody has to move to, really has to act to awaken the, yung, yung fire ulit ng mga tao. Here's a quick follow-up. Do you think, new, because of the disinformation, gaslighting, misinformation, ito maas yung boiling point ng tao? Medyo, oo, oo. Tingin ko naman, meron namang, ano, meron namang mga, uh, marami na ako nakikita rin lately sa Twitter, ganyan, na parang they are realizing na, uh, oy, dati I, I believed in this person, in this, uh, in this president, and I voted for him. But now, <clears throat> nakikita nila talaga na, ano, uh, ang mga inefficiency, ang mga kamalian, at mga, false information na pinagkakalat nila. Yun. So okay, I so, think, yeah, kailangan talaga. <laughs> They're doing it to themselves, actually. <laughs> okay, yeah. salamat, Lisa. So next question is coming from Momar Visaya of Asian Journal. Momar? Yes, to our panelists, um, there are people saying that the recent uh, red tagging of um, Lisa and attorney um, Rafi here is just a distraction among the many distractions that the government um, or the, play, the, the powers that be um, have been throwing uh, to attempt to draw discussions away from COVID-19 vaccine, yung 15 billion ng PhilHealth and human rights abuses. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, Rafi. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Well, when you use the term disruption, it presupposes uh, a sense of purpose, deliberation. I do not think uh, this government has the wit for that. No, uh, It's really a, a multi-front uh, assault on everything that makes a democracy a democracy. It's, it's just that. No, it's, it's just how they roll, I think. They bungled co the, the, the COVID uh, response of the country in the same way that they're bungling uh, on the West Philippine Sea and, uh, uh, and, and this, no? uh, allowing the counterinsurgency to cross over into uh, an assault against uh, democratic dissent in general. So it's just a multi-front multi bungling on the on the front, on the, on the part of this regime. Why? Well, because of impunity, I suppose. Um, and all, it also, I think, bears the mark of, of uh, the person in the center of political power. It's, there is still validity to that uh, uh, thinking that this is a replication of a, the Davao experience, really, uh, brought to the national scale. I, I don't think the strategy of this regime is that carefully calibrated uh, to, to, uh, for us to say that these are deliberate destructions. They're just being themselves, bungling on all fronts. Okay, so no, man, I, I know. Think, ma I'm oh, sorry. Ahead, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, ako naman, inisip ko, baka it's possible, but uh, I tend to agree with Rafi. Kaya lang, whether or not uh, it is a distraction, we have to bring back those issues to the forefront. Kasi uh, totoo rin naman, uh, nadidistract, whether or not uh, sinasadya yun ng gobyerno, nadidistract din somehow no, mga tao. 
but it's our duty, I guess, to bring it back, to bring those issues back and keep on questioning these uh, people for their inefficiencies and their corruption. Okay, so um, we have another question coming from um, one of the press club members, Lambert Parong. Uh, what, ca what can you tell us, uh, well, can you tell us about the reaction, if any, from UP graduates now serving the government or in the Duterte administration? So do we know of any UP grads now serving in the administration and how are they reacting to this situation? Any takers? You know, there are a lot of UP graduates serving in administration. There are even UP graduates in the military. Mm -hmm. And so far, uh, they've, ex they've, they've uh, I mean, those who have uh, reached out to me have expressed support for, for, for the university. You know, they don't agree with uh, the, the <clears throat> unilateral abrogation of the, of the agreement. And uh, a lot of them uh, support uh, the calls for uh, a renegoti renegotiation of the agreement. Nasabi ko pati military. In fact, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, see, si, um, what's his name? Harry Rocker. No? <laughs> if I read between the lines, no, he, he, Shampa, he's, a, he's a presidential spokesperson. He cannot really speak out. No? But uh, if you read between the lines of what he's saying, uh, I think uh, he, he, he thinks that uh, it was a bad move on the part of the DND to abrogate the agreement. So we quick follow up po. Is the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, Don. Uh, we have uh, Professor uh, uh, Tonet Rakisa who would like to give an input on the issue. Uh, Tonet, are you in? Yeah. Thank you. Thank hey. You. Oh, I know. I know. So um. Anyway, so I just want to uh, give to hi Marina also and uh, and Lisa. Anyway. <laughs> and so anyway, there are just two things that I I need to uh, just to add. To the discussion, one is uh, in the question of in the question of uh, are there people rising up? We have to also realize that next year is election, and so in a way, elections always has a chilling effect on protests. People are waiting. People are preparing for the elections. So that's one of the that's one of the uh, that's one of the I think you know, like. If you're talking about the middle class, if you're talking about you know allies from the from uh, ibang sectors, lalo na sa business, they will in fact be looking at the elections right now. So that, that's one that's one major um, um, factor that I think we need to consider. But the second thing in regards to your question of uh, why you tanong ni Marina, like uh, what does Duterte want? Because he has everything, which is true. But the thing that I think, and I also would agree, but in a, a differently lang in terms of yung sinabi ni, ni Rocky, that this is a security, this is actually yung, yung uh, red tagging, yung militarism, is, is for me, uh, is driven by the security forces. There are two things. One is they, the, the military is after the, is after the left. Okay. But the, but they are, but they know they are. They have a, an opportunity right now because you have a popular president, right? So, and that popular president is going to be will will be uh, will be gone next year. So, in other words, it, this is my this is my reading. In other words, they have this window of opportunity from here to the election to make use of this time to actually run after the the run after the CPP. That's one. The second thing is we also have to look at it from the regional perspective. The military in Southeast Asia are now the ones in, in, in have the momentum, right? So even in Myanmar, right? So let's just look at Myanmar, the military in Myanmar that took that, you know, they have Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi actually has, has gambled a lot of, you know, her reputation to do you know, to actually uh, compromise. Well, she's also an internationalist, but, you know, she did a lot of you, the bidding of the military. So the question is, going back to Marina, what's, it, what's in it for the military? Why did the military have to, uh, 
you know, uh, dismantle the NLD regime when they, they actually have what they, they actually have what they want. Okay. They're looking at Thailand. Okay. So again, you have to look at it from also not only from the not only from the Philippine perspective, but you have you know you have the military in the region looking at each other. One 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 interesting thing is that um, Myanmar turned to to democ to you know the democracy <clears throat> experiment because they were studying Indonesia. Okay, now Indonesia is looking at Myanmar and Thailand. So again, so. So you put in the military now in, in the Philippines, right? You have the military in the Philippines. There is now very, very aggressive. They have, we've seen this in, in New York, they had a recent, uh, they have their own military, they have their own propaganda machine. Right? They have now movies about heroes of uh, the military, so on and so, which we've never seen before. So again, these are, these are like, you know, these are, uh, indications that the military is being is becoming highly politicized and they're actually following a trend in Southeast Asia okay okay so we would like to uh, invite Julie Hamora to tell us about uh, the Philippine Human Rights Act uh, we uh, Julie would like to tell us about what we can do after the forum and see if uh, there are certain points of action for us um, uh, and, and that, that would respond to the to this ongoing onslaught against uh, the uh, academic freedom in, in the Philippines. So uh, Julie So Julie is a Julie Hamora is a member of the National Secretariat of the Malaya movement. It's a broad movement of individuals and organizations that uphold, assert and defend human rights democracy and so sovereignty in the Philippines. She's also a convener of the New York um, for Philippine Human Rights Act Coalition and a board member of the France Metro New York. So here's our call to action presented by Julie Hamora. Oh, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah, I have of course. Action. Oh, it says disabled. I might need to be a co-host. Yeah, I'll, I'll make you a co-host something like that. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, I guess in, in the meantime, while I'm I become a co-host and I'll share my screen. Uh, but magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Uh, thank you so much to the scholars ng Bayan and the organizers of this really important event. And although I know our Inung Bayan may be far away for those of us who are overseas, but there are very concrete ways that we can take action from abroad to defend human rights and academic freedom for our Kababayan back home. Um, let's see. Oh, great. So I'm a co-host now. Thank you, Noel. Okay. Yes, I'm so honored to be here and speak about the Philippine Human Rights Act. Um, and just to note about the Malaya movement, we are based here in the United States. We have over 29 chapters across the country. And we also have um, country chapters in Canada and in Australia. And um, to note, oh, one second. Let me make sure I share my audio. Okay, my screen is back. Great. Um, and so we know um, under the Duterte regime, it, um, under his leadership since 2016, the Philippines is known to be the deadliest country for land defenders, for environmental activists, uh, lawyers, um, and also trade unionists. 
um, despite the human rights record and the human rights track record of the Duterte regime that is well documented, uh, the United States uh, continues to send over 550 million US tax dollars since 2016 to the Philippine military and police. Um, and that's not even including arms and weapon sales, uh, which the US has brokered billions and billions of US dollars um, for the Philippine military and police. Um, and as we know, and what we've heard today um, about what's happening at UP and across the Philippines, uh, that there is a need to demand an end to this aid to the Philippines. So with the Philippine Human Rights Act, uh, we've been working on this for um, the last two years in collaboration with the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, with Kabataan Alliance, um, and many lab labor unions, the faith sector it really is a big show of solidarity. Um, but it aims to suspend US states, United States security assistance to the Philippines until such a time as human rights violations by Philippine security forces cease and responsible state forces are held accountable. We know that this really takes a powerful people's movement, which we have been trying to grow. And there is so much solidarity from across the country and internationally for the situation that's happening in the Philippines. So it is something really hopeful uh, to look towards. Um, and the Philippine Human Rights Act, it was actually introduced to US Congress in September of last year. And now with the new administration, it'll be reintroduced again uh, by uh, Susan, Representative Susan Wild, um, hopefully in the next month or two. Um, and I just wanna show this quick video. It's uh, less than a minute long and it, it shows um, when the bill was introduced um, into Congress. <laughs> Rodrigo Duterte's brutal regime is using the pretext of a so-called anti-terrorism law to ramp up efforts targeting labor organizers, workers, and political opponents. In response to these abuses, I introduced the Philippine Human Rights Act, which would block U.S. funding for police or military assistance to the Philippines, outlining a series of basic criteria which would have to be met in order to resume such funding. Let us stand with the people of the Philippines. So very exciting and you know, if you're you're overseas in the US, uh, these are some ways that you can get involved with the human, Philippine Human Rights Act. If you wanna learn more, please visit humanrightsph.org. And we're looking for as many community organizations as we can to endorse. It really takes our community and the will of the people. And you know, it's the eve of the people power revolution, the anniversary. So um, as we learn through our history, that's the kind of movement that we really need to build uh, for the Philippines. So please Please, if you're part of an organization, endorse the PHRA. And as an individual, everybody can sign the petition urging their uh, representatives to support uh, the Philippine Human Rights Act. And if you, you can get involved and lobby your representatives, just get in contact with all of us at uh, Malaya Movement. And, um, you know, the best thing we can all do too is to get organized. It's so powerful to see all of the UP community here today. Uh, it'd be amazing to see a UP alumni organization continuing the fight, which I know you all are doing. And there's um, a letter, I believe, um, sign on letters that are being organized. But if you're interested, please join the Malaya movement, jo join a human rights collective, a community organization. There are so many out here also uh, like Pinas um, and, I wanted to leave you all with an invitation. Um, on Friday, we are hosting uh, our commemoration of the 35th anniversary of EDSA. Um, it's called EDSA 35 Lessons in Ousting a Dictator. And we'll hear firsthand testimony from EDSA alumni, uh, current activists in the Philippines and in the US as we draw lessons on the people power movement under the current dictatorship. So maraming salamat. Um, I'll copy paste all the links for the PHRA into the chat and um, we can share all the info with you. All right, thank you, Julie. So uh, with that, it's been an hour and a half. I, I did realize that it was going to be this long. Marami pa tayong kailangan pag-usapan. But um, meron pa tong kasunod. 
So, isasara na natin muna ang ating tambayan talk for now. Babalikan natin. Uh, stay tuned for the announcement. In closing, um, I came across Attorney Rafi's uh, Facebook post announcing this first tambayan talk. And I was struck when he cited two lines from our UP anthem, and UP Nating Mahal. Sabi ng yung two lines na yun, malayong lupain, amin man marating, di rin magbabago ang damdamin. So on that note, um, maraming salamat sa pagdalo ninyo. Thank you for stopping by and stay tuned for the next Tambayan Talk. Um, maraming salamat and ingat. Paalam. <laughs>